Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. In this podcast, Tim Manaya, PRI's Director of Communications, and I welcome back our colleague Wayne Weingarten, PRI's Senior Fellow in Business and Economics. Wayne has a new study out, Breaking Down Barriers to Entrepreneurship. Based on every measure, regulations are holding back individuals from starting and growing small businesses. While state and federal policymakers have stopped the tsunami of regulations from the Obama era, Wayne believes that lawmakers must do more. For example, reform occupational licensing laws that deny job opportunities for many and fix broken state workers' compensation laws that drive up costs and reduce entrepreneurship. We think you'll find this study interesting. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Next Round, Wayne. Thanks for having me back. So your new series, Breaking Down Barriers to Opportunity, focuses on how government regulations are hurting the expansion of entrepreneurship and and small businesses. Before we talk about your findings, let's let's set the stage. Just how important are small businesses for entrepreneurship and growing the U.S. economy? If if your goal is to have kind of a a robust economy and to use the term that benefits, you know, benefits are widely shared, then it's indispensable, right? The contribution comes in so many different ways ways because if you think about small businesses they're so varied right you know for many people you know entrepreneurship is a pathway to the middle class you know for others it's establishing kind of something that becomes the anchor for the local community you know others are going to, are going to dream about they have a brand new innovation and they're dreaming of becoming the next Google or the next Microsoft uh, you know all of these are the types of contributions that small businesses make uh, to the economy and if you think about kind of that that broad based widely shared, robust growing economy, they're just indispensable. Wayne, you begin your study by noting that the entrepreneurial sector in the U.S. economy has actually been declining for several years. Why is this such a troubling trend in your view? Well, it's, it's really the flip side of what we just spoke about, right? Uh, take take the problem of stagnating wages or, or low productivity growth. Traditionally, small businesses, they're one of the key drivers of jobs, of income growth, of wages, of productivity. So if you have a weak small business sector, it's, it's unfortunately not surprising that we have these disappointing trends. Wayne, one major takeaway that I had reading your study is just how much risk people undertake when starting a new small business or taking their innovation into the marketplace. Just how risky is it for people to create a small business and how likely is it that a new venture will actually fail? It's actually very risky. It's a, it's a great question. It's, it's very risky. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of fortitude to become a small uh, business person. You know, measuring that risk is always tricky, and they're going to vary by industry and what you're doing. And obviously, how good your idea is is, is going to have a, a major impact. But if you if you look at the statistics and and how we measure it, the Small Business Administration they say that about one half of all new businesses will have failed uh, within the first five years. So I guess depending upon whether you're a cup is half empty or a cup is half full kind of person, you know, I guess that'll determine whether you think the uh, that's actually risky or not. Um, but uh, f- from my view, I think if, if half are failing uh, within the first five years, that that exemplifies uh, just the amount of risk that people are undertaking when they, when they decide to start a new small business. The first thing that our readers uh, of your study will note when they see the study is the symbolism of the cover, which is a young woman chipping away at a giant rock. And it really paints a picture of entrepreneurs like her who are having to overcome so many obstacles imposed by government in order to just succeed. So what are some of these hurdles that new and expanding small businesses must jump through every day? And are there any figures that quantify the costs of regulations on these small businesses? Well, you know, beyond the typical market hurdles that always exist, this study focused on the regulatory hurdles. Just to back up real quick, and it's not just regulations that matter from kind of what the government uh, can do. Um, places like California, right, we have an overly excessive tax burden, and those taxes become a tremendous hurdle as well. But regulations are particularly onerous. And in fact, we look at the surveys of small businesses, that's one of the top complaints they often have. So the National Federation of Independent Businesses, NFIB, they, they do a, a monthly survey of small businesses. And what's your biggest concern? Now, during the Obama presidency, it was by far 
the number one hurdle was regulations, and it was up at 20, 25%. It's come down since then, but it continues to be uh, regulations, a large concern of small businesses. And, and I think to kind of bring that point home, a study by uh, Crane and Crane, and I say, for full disclosure, uh, Mark Crane was actually uh, one of my dissertation advisors uh, way back in the, in the day, but they did a study that looked at the average regulatory cost per employee. And this was uh, back in 2012, uh, the, the burden, and they measured it in 2014 dollars. And the average cost was just under $10,000. But if you actually looked at it per employee for a small firm, it was almost $12,000, whereas for firms with more than 100 people, it was about 9000 So you can see kind of that big difference in cost of the same regulations on the small business versus larger the larger businesses. And that's just because they don't have the scale to kind of hire the lawyers, to hire the you know, compliance officers who are going to be handling it over a much larger business. You kind of get that economy of scale. And we just don't get that for small businesses. Wayne, the, the major component of your study is determining whether a growing regulatory burden is associated with a less vibrant entrepreneurial sector in a given state. Walk our listeners through your review of the data and research. What did you conclude? Do regulations hurt entrepreneurship? Glad to. I mean, this was the whole kind of the point of the study is we wanted to understand that impact. Uh, and, and looking at the states, they're always a great test subject for researchers because they have these policy differences. So it's as close as you're ever going to get in economics to kind of that, that laboratory experiment, uh, which is always so important. Uh, and, and I think this is one of the more interesting kind of tests that we did in the study. So what I did is I updated um, several years ago, we did a, a small business uh, index where we rate, rank the states based on how friendly they are towards businesses, or I should say what, how, how much obstructions, how much obstructions they uh, impose. And so we use that methodology and simply focus on the labor regulations uh, that the states would put into place. So take things like occupational licensing, law, licensing laws, uh, setting a minimum wage above the federal level or worker compensation mandates. Uh, we, we ranked each one of these categories. There were seven in all based on how much of a cost these regulations are going to be imposing. So across the seven labor regulatory categories, what we found was that Virginia uh, has the most entrepreneurial friendly regulatory environment for labor regulations. Uh, that was followed by North Dakota and Georgia. And the least uh, friendly regulatory environments was in Rhode Island, California, and New Jersey. So we had this list of who was the most costly re labor regulation states, what were the least costly labor regulation states. We then compared that, the state ranking, to the growth in small business payrolls and small business employment. So we have a, on one side the growth in small businesses, and on the other side, how burdensome the regulations are. And what we found is a very strong negative association, particularly if you look at the top third of the states, the, be, you know, the best regulation states, they had significantly stronger growth in small business payrolls, and they had significantly stronger growth in small business employment compared to the rest of the states. Or again, providing support to that general kind of notion that regulations are hurting entrepreneurship. We did similar tests looking at the federal level, where we looked at the there's a, there's a publication where all the regulations are uh, published. And we looked at the size of that. And <laughs> unsurprisingly, as that grew, as more and more regulations were added, the growth in small businesses uh, was, was worse. Um, we, we did a similar test where we looked at industries that require more uh, compliance officers, more lawyers, more people required to comply with the regulatory burden. And what did we find? Those industries that had required more people to comply with regulations, therefore had a higher regulatory burden, also had fewer small businesses as part of the uh, of the industry mix. So kind of looking at all of these different ways, what we found is that consistent finding that however you measure the regulatory burden, as that increases, the vibrancy of the small business sector, that decreased. I think one of the interesting things when reading your study is that a lot of the burdensome regulations that you talk about are actually promoted by proponents and state lawmakers as being done in the name of quote, protecting workers. But as you discuss, these regulations actually hurt workers in the long run and lead to fewer opportunities and lower wages. How so? 
<laughs> to, to, to quote the, uh, the president, uh, you, you know, the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, it, these regulations damage economic growth. And when you have a slow growing economy, it's workers, particularly low skilled workers, who are going to suffer the most. And so we're at a point where the regulatory burden is excessive. I mean, obviously, there need to be regulations. But the point is, we've pushed it to such a damaging level, to such a burdensome level that the regulations are no longer a positive force and they become a negative. That harms growth, diminishes the growth in the small business sector. It robs workers of the jobs and the potential raises that would have occurred. And, you know, worse than that, it is denying people the opportunity to strike out on their own because there's there's not uh, on the kind of when you're going out to start the business, the business environment is less robust. So there's a smaller chance of success. But there's also there's more even more risk. We talked earlier about how risky it is to start a small business. When you have a slow growing economy and the jobs aren't plentiful, people are going to be much more uh, reticent to start a job, I mean, to start a small business, uh, because if the small business fails, the, their recovery uh, is going to be that much harder uh, from that failure. Finding a new job would be more burdensome. It might be lower paying. So the costs of starting a small business are, are larger. You know, for all of these reasons, what you're looking at is as the government regulates more, particularly in the name of helping workers, what you're actually doing is harming workers. When you single out one regulation in particular, occupational licensing laws, as being especially anti-worker, you know, in, in one case here in California, I recall there was a, a bill to allow people to shampoo other people. And this isn't hairstyling. This is just shampooing without having to go through the hundreds of hours of training and thousands of dollars to, to uh, uh, get an official cosmetology license. And unfortunately, that bill, as simple as that, actually went down. Um, describe how occupational licensing laws hurt opportunity and why is government enacting barriers to work in the first place? Yeah, <laughs> to the second question, that that is, that is a fantastic question. I have no idea. Uh, in terms of kind of its impact, it's 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 really simple econ one type stuff, right? Occupational licensing laws increase the cost for someone to join that profession, right? In in the study, I looked at uh, barbers in Connecticut as the example. And if you want to become a barber in Connecticut, you have to complete one thousand hours of training. I mean, that's just ridiculous. So if you put that as a full-time job, you're talking about six months of your life that has to be devoted towards full-time training. Meanwhile, you're not getting paid. I mean, that that becomes an incredible uh, barrier to become a barber. Uh, And so what you're, again, doing when you raise the cost of something, you're going to get less of it. And so what we're doing is we're discouraging people from getting these jobs, but you're also then discouraging and making it more difficult for entrepreneurs to strike out on their own because now their cost of labor is higher. Perhaps they had a harder time getting the licenses they need. So there's all sorts of obstructions that you're creating and you're doing it unnecessarily. And and I I think there's actually something kind of odd about this because allegedly these restrictions are there to protect consumers, right? So the the argument goes, you know, taking an electrician as an example. Uh, Most consumers, you're not going to know if an electrician is really qualified. So you're going to have this government-imposed license that's going to become the good housekeeping seal of approval to let you know that they are qualified. You know, and, and of course, ironically, in today's environment with all the different websites that are out there and technology has evolved, that is less and less necessary for the government to play this role. And in fact, more and more of these occupational licensing laws are going outside of this, oh, I need to have that protection, you know, electrician, plumber, or things that you may not understand. But going to someone like a barber, well, you know, whether somebody is a good hairstylist or not is just as much of a qualitative issue as it is a quantitative. You, you, you're you really not achieving the purpose of the occupational licensing law, which is protecting consumers, but you are having a huge negative impact on the kind of um, aspiring barbers, on entrepreneurs, on kind of the, the health of the economy. Wayne, let's talk about technology. You know, there's a big debate going on about the future of work in this country. And innovation is really transforming our economy every day. And a lot of that innovation starts with entrepreneurs taking the risk and starting a small business. Based on your research, how does overregulation thwart this kind of innovation that's so important for our economic future? I, I think it, it, at the most basic level, what it does is it uh, discourages 
discourages the innovators of tomorrow from even trying. So, you know, so many people are going to see that regulatory burden and just give up. Or for those who do try, it forces them to spend too much of their time dealing with regulations, complying with regulations, which generally speaking is not what they do well. And it leaves them less time to create, to innovate, to come up with the products for tomorrow that we don't yet know that we can't live without. And so you're taking away from that. Uh, and that's basically the process of thwarting the, the innovation that's going to help all of us thrive uh, and live better lives. You make the case that the current regulatory burden in most states hurts small businesses and the economy. What types of reforms do you recommend policymakers adopt to encourage small business creation and growth and, and more opportunities for workers? I, I think the, you know, the the whole bioethic precept of uh, primum non nocere, you know, first do no harm, it, it, I think that's the place to start, right? If you look across the country, how many states are pushing for the $15 minimum wage? You know, when New York City just imposed it, and what happened there? In a in a growing economy where the labor force expanded, the hospitality industry, the number of workers declined. We see, la- you know, we see layoffs, we see uh, uh, waiters getting uh, fewer hours. So even if you are able to keep your job, uh, you're working less. So on net, is your paycheck bigger? I, I, I you know, that's a that's a good question. And so we we've got to stop these kind of this regulatory push where we're really going to make the bad situation worse. And then once we can kind of stop the bad ideas from progressing, then we need to work on continued regulatory rollback. How do we make workers' compensation laws less costly to comply with? How do we reduce the mandates from occupational licensing laws? How do we kind of make all of our labor regulations so they achieve the goals that they're out to do in the, in the least costly way possible? And also take those laws that we don't really don't need, like take the occupational licensing laws. Do we really need occupational licensing for barbers? And if so, how much training do we need? And I'm guessing it's not a thousand hours. So ideas like that, accepting, you know, licenses across state lines so that if you want to move, you make it easier for people to take their profession with them. That's a problem that happens with a lot of military families who, by kind of definition, end up moving around a lot. And often the the spouse has issues if their occupation requires licensing across multiple states. How do we get compacts across the states so that if I'm licensed to practice, you know, to be a barber in California, I can certainly do it in Virginia, have that transfer. You know, ideas like this that make it easier for people to practice their trade, reduce the costs, uh, and, and again, promote work and growth, not discourage it. Well, Wayne, now that we're all hooked after having read your first study in the series, we'd love a preview of coming attractions. So what are some of the other issues and topics that you'll be exploring in future studies in the Breaking Down Barriers to Opportunity series? I hope everyone is hooked. Um, <laughs> the next topic, I think there's a uh, two big topics that I think are very important uh, to, to look into. Uh, the first is with the technology sector. As I'm sure everyone's aware, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, they're now putting pushing for greater regulation uh, in the technology sector. Uh, and where that will stop is certainly an unknown, but I, I, I think it's fairly confident. I think I can be very fairly confident in saying that this is not going to be a good thing. This is not going to encourage uh, greater technological growth. And this is really you know, one of the strengths of our economy, something we should be promoting, not discouraging. So I think that can be very dis- uh, a disconcerting trend. And it's something that uh, I'd like to look into deeper to come up with, how do we have a pro-market response to these issues, not a greater regulatory response. I think the other important topic that uh, is important to address is how can we have or use entrepreneurship and encourage entrepreneurship as a means for uh, raising the incomes uh, at the lower uh, uh, scales. I think that that's a completely underappreciated pathway. And I think there's obstacles that we need to remove in order to help those people who you know, are, are aspiring for middle-class lifestyles or better to help them achieve that. And so uh, that, that'll be another topic that we'll be addressing. Great. Thanks so much, Wayne. Well, thank you. Have a great one. Special thanks to Wayne Weingarten and to Tim and Aya. The Breaking Down Barriers to Entrepreneurship study can be found at PRI's website at pacificresearch.org. If you're working on your vacation plans, consider mixing policy and cruising. Join PRI and Claremont Institute for our joint 40th anniversary cruise on the Mediterranean. The cruise starts in Barcelona and ends in Rome with a special tour of the Vatican. Special guests include Andrew Roberts, author of the New York Times bestseller, Churchill Walking with Destiny, and Charles Kessler, editor of the Claremont Review of Books, and of course, our own Sally Pipes. 
For more details, visit ci-pri.com. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.